I'm Ted Myers with the Cognitive Portfolio, and today I have with me Omid Norozi, Associate Professor of Education Technology and EdTech Project Coordinator at the Wageningen University and Research of the Netherlands. It's great to have you with us today, Omid. Thank you, Ted. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Fantastic. Why don't we start off and you can tell us a little bit about your background. Well, uh, I'm originally from Iran, but uh, 13 years ago, I came here to the Netherlands to do my PhD. And I did uh, my PhD on the field of educational technology. And after that, I became assistant professor uh, of educational technology. And now currently, I am associate professor of educational technology at Wageningen University and Research, which we call it WUR. Uh, but uh, during the last 13 years, I've visited uh, many universities worldwide, and I've done uh, quite a lot of sabbaticals, for example, in the University of Michigan in the U.S., in University of Polo in Finland, in University of ESEG in France, and also Tarbiat Mudaris University in Iran. And uh, what I'm uh, actually doing in this uh, field of educational technology is that I'm trying to make sure that the technology is uh, getting to students in the best possible way so that students uh, could uh, take advantage of the technology. And uh, that's uh, why I'm passionate about the use of technology in education, in classrooms, et cetera. Fantastic. It sounds like you've had a, quite a journey uh, across many countries and have gotten to see the use of technology and education uh, in a number of use cases. I'm curious, how did you first become interested in education technology and what defined your journey uh, when building your ed tech career? Have you always known that this was uh, your calling or has this uh, been a mosaic that you've built along your varied career? Yeah, uh, basically 13 years ago, when I came to the Netherlands, uh, my background, my uh, actually the master thesis and bachelor thesis was about agricultural water management, which had nothing to do with the technology, which had nothing to do with the education. So I came to the Netherlands, I was following some courses, and then I actually as a student, uh, when I was following those courses, I saw that the, the great benefit of the technology in our classrooms. Then uh, I was thinking to myself, I was uh, uh, always uh, uh, talking to myself, so why can't we use this technology in education in our classrooms in Iran, for example? Because uh, I saw that many teachers use these digital games, uh, simulations, and uh, all kinds of uh, advanced uh, technology and tools, uh, which uh, I saw the added value of that. And I said, okay, now this is time to change my topic. This is the time to go for something that I'm passionate about. And I became passionate about this technology. The more classrooms I followed, the more passionate I became. And uh, thus I talked to my supervisor. I said, I'm going to change my topic. And then he said, what, why you are going to do that? And then I explained the necessity of this. And I knew that the technology is going to boom in the future. And uh, so I finally convinced my supervisor that uh, I need to write another proposal. And I did so. And many people advised me against this decision, but I already made my decision and I already saw the added value of technology for education, for classrooms. And I'm very, very happy that I made that decision. And I think that was the turning point in my life and in my career, uh, basically. Fantastic. So you saw a need and you capitalized and you, you wrote a proposal to, to fill the need and the rest is history. I think uh, our our interest in ed tech has come from a similar place. You know, I've uh, done a lot of research and just seen the gap between technology that exists and the technology that's in place right now, uh, you know, teaching our students. So uh, that's, you know, what drove the cognitive portfolio to get more interested. Uh, along those lines, in your 13 year ed tech career, what uh, ed tech projects or initiatives have you successfully completed and, and which of those uh, you know, do you feel like have had the biggest impact on your students? 
Well, quite a lot, huh? quite a lot of tools and technologies, but uh, I've been busy mostly with the various ed tech projects who deal with the technology enhanced learning environments uh, to foster higher education students, higher order skills, 21st century skills, or maybe you can even call it soft skills. These skills include problem solving, argumentation, critical thinking, reasoning, entrepreneurial thinking, self-regulation, communication, and presentation skills. Let me give you a couple of examples of these uh, technologies. For example, digital online modules. I have uh, designed, implemented, and evaluated quite a lot of these modules, uh, which help to foster students' collaboration skills, argumentation skills, and self-regulation skills. Augmented reality and virtual reality that I have uh, been uh, busy with that project with people uh, from uh, uh, actually University of Applied Sciences in Utrecht, Dr. Stan van Hinkel. And uh, so basically we use them in order to facilitate the way in which uh, students practice their presentation skills, uh, which I will give you further information on that later. I've used uh, many online assessment and self-reflection tools like a train tool code grade comproved Graswell as a head of the education uh, ed tech evaluation uh, coordinator at WUR. I've been dealing with these tools and uh, they are very helpful in uh, various aspects such as assessment and self-reflection. I've also done research on MOOCs and uh, uh, studied uh, students' motivation, learning, and engagement uh, with these MOOCs, digital entrepreneurial tools, uh, which uh, help the students uh, identify uh, their opportunity or identification and also opportunity evaluation. Various other tools, for example, I've used the Feedback Fruit uh, tool, which helped the students to uh, actually write uh, uh, kind of structured argumentative essay, which uh, basically we facilitate the peer feedback process for that. And th this has been very helpful. And I'm very happy that I'm cooperating with this feedback fruit company. Digital games and simulations, as well as learning analytics, which uh, help the students uh, actually get the most important uh, update about their current activities and I mostly use them for the peer feedback and the uptake of the peer feedback processes. So these are a couple of examples that I've been dealing with over the last 13 years and those mostly have a lot of added value for students and of course they have their own challenges which uh, uh, as a kind of ed tech evaluator uh, my job is to uh, find out about these challenges and provide support and solutions to deal with these challenges in uh, our class. Fantastic. That's uh, quite a well-rounded host of education initiatives that you've implemented so far. There's a couple I'd love to, to double down on, but I'd be remiss to say that's uh, fantastic that you've implemented Feedback Fruits at your, your university. As you know, we've had Ewad and Dan at Feedback Fruits on the show and, and really enjoyed hearing their perspective on the learning feedback management system. So fantastic to hear that their tools at good use at were. So I wanted to, uh, to, to ask more about the uh, AR and VR feedback for uh, presentations. So you know, maybe we could walk through a, a use case, but let's say I'm a, you know, PhD student, uh, maybe I excel in, in research and, uh, you know, writing thesis papers and really synthesizing my results, but I'm not so good at, like you said, the soft skills, having the conversations around my findings and presenting those findings to a, a larger community or group. So let's say I'm giving a presentation, how would AR or VR assist me in real time in improving my presentation skills? So basically, the, I think more information can be found from the University of Applied Sciences by Dr. Van Hinkel, who is, uh, I think, the, the, a great leading scholar in the field of VR in uh, uh, education. And I've been uh, fortunate enough to collaborate with him in a couple of projects. And uh, so as a student, uh, what you can do with this VR is that you uh, give a presentation and the VR system gives you personalized feedback in terms of a variety of aspects. For example, in terms of the eye contact, in terms of the hand gestures, in terms of the intonation, 
body language and nonverbal communication, basically. So if you, for example, don't have a good intonation, the system gives you alerts uh, that you need to actually have another intonation. If you, you don't use your hands or if you use your hands in a kind of distractive manner, again, the system will give you feedback. If you talk too fast or if you talk too loud, the system does the same. If you talk uh, uh, calmly or if you talk too slow, the same uh, alert you receive from the feedback uh, uh, from the VR feedback system. So this way, the students can practice their presentation skills in a very safe environment, which is not normally the case in real uh, presentation. So this uh, VR provides a very safe environment for students to practice their uh, presentation in front of the imaginary audience. So thousands of audience could be in front of you or a couple of them depends on what you want and th this audience will react on the spot depending on how you perform during your presentation and uh, this is the great advantage for students especially nowadays that we are uh, dealing with the shortage of teachers so we don't have teachers to give specialized personalized feedback to each student with regard to their presentation but this app, this system, could really do a lot in that regard. I agree. Well, not only in terms of defining what it means to be a good presenter or to have an engaging speech, but to really codify that and then create a tool to provide the feedback to students real time. That's fantastic. I remember uh, when I was learning how to give uh, presentations, I would record myself on the photo booth and, and watch myself back live and, and give myself harsh criticism. And that was not so fun watching yourself uh, a video. So I, I definitely would have appreciated uh, some, some more you know, live feedback instead of just having to uh, critique myself on video. So uh, it, fantastic to see how far things are coming in, in such a short time. So I want to take a step back here for a minute. Uh, you know, it's, you've implemented a lot of great projects, uh, and I'm sure there's many more. But do you have any goals or ambitions uh, at a high level, either as an, the ed tech coordinator or as a professor as a whole? Where do you see kind of your uh, your impact as a whole being throughout the education space? Are there certain uh, projects that you'd like to implement, or is there a certain level of technology aptitude uh, that you would like to see your university and your students reach that you'll kind of feel that you've made, um, you know, the biggest accomplishment and, and biggest impact possible that you can? Yes, my goal, the, my overall goal is to help uh, students take advantage of the technology, benefit from the technology, despite some challenges that the technology brings with itself. Huh? And uh, uh, if you are uh, asking me to, what I would like to do uh, personally, I would like to actually use this technology in the best possible ways to facilitate all kind of soft skills that I just mentioned to you. So I'm, I'm not going to use VR only, for example, for the presentation skills, but I'm going to expand that to all kind of 21st century skills that is needed for graduates to enter into the job market. For example, one thing that is missing from students is the level of argumentation, critical thinking and reasoning, because it is difficult for some students to engage in uh, counter arguments to bring counter arguments or some of them are uh, afraid of losing face if they you know disagree with uh, someone or some of them do not just provide counter arguments because uh, of uh, their state of mind because of their emotional reaction so what i want to do is to again provide a safe environment for students to uh, practice these soft skills in a very uh, the kind of practical manner and uh, uh, basically you know I'm not like those who just uh, do the research uh, on technology what I like to see is to see the real uh, real actions that is happening in the classroom so to make the link between the theory and practice that is my goal to uh, bridge this gap 
which is a uh, very, very important uh, factor nowadays in our academic setting. So either they focus mostly on the research or on the practice. But for me, both research and practice uh, are the same. And I would like students to actually take advantage of this technology in their classrooms as well. Sure, sure. A technology can be highly effective on paper, but I'm sure a number of factors could prevent, you know, the full impact being made, whether it's adoption or user experience or, or even just, you know, the research and impact of the tool itself. So, you know, uh, results are not uh, on paper. So it's, it's good that you're not only, uh, you know, helping with the strategy of these uh, implementations, but also, you know, you're in the classroom making sure that uh, the tools are being used to their uh, highest effectivity. That's great. Exactly. So uh, looking forward, uh, are there any projects uh, on the horizon near term or, or even long term that have you really excited uh, and that you think will, you know, kind of bring that next big uh, shift in education technology to your students? Yes, uh, actually, you know that Netherlands is very good in terms of artificial intelligence, in terms of learning analytics uh, and computational thinking, the machine learning. So what I would like to do is to combine this uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, the research areas and put that in practice. For example, what I'd like to do in the next decade basically is to combine computational th uh, thinking, machine learning, and learning analytics in order to detect the students' uh, uh, kind of line of reasoning, in order to actually detect uh, the, the, the flaws in their reasoning, in their argumentation, and offer adaptive support uh, in that regard. So, for example, you write a kind of essay, and the technology should detect all kinds of flaws in this essay and offer support until the students become experts so that he or she does not make any mistake again when he uh, writes uh, the essay again. So adaptation of technology, basically, with the use of this advanced uh, kind of machine learning and computational th thinking and also the language uh, uh, processing. So this is one uh, the kind of big dream that I have and I would like to implement that in the next 10 in the next 10 years as well as also working on the vr and augmented reality for other type of soft skills for example argumentation critical thinking and reasoning next to the presentation skills so these are the two top priority in my list of agenda which i would like to work in the next decade lofty priorities indeed you know uh, I think it's really interesting how you're taking it from implementing tools that facilitate peer feedback to now developing a tool that will be the peer feedback itself, you know, and I think on, on a lower level, it might be easy to say, give feedback on math results or, or spelling or grammar, but at the higher order of education that you're dealing with, I think that feedback on some of these really complex topics, you know, a thesis paper or a PhD level debate, you know, that's really high level thinking and critical, critical thinking skills. So to have a computer that can parse those arguments and give applicable feedback that that will help a PhD student, I think, you know, in theory, that's a fantastic idea. But as you know, and as we all know, the devil is in the details and implementation. So I'm sure uh, there's a long way to go in terms of creating a, a artificial intelligence that's able to have that intelligent discourse, you know, with with highly educated individuals. So yes. wish you the best of luck in that project. Thank you. And, and the, the good things, uh, the two good things about this project is that they don't depend on any domain. So this can be applied in any soft uh, domain, any hard domain, mathematics, physics, chemistry, education, psychology. So that is not domain specific restricted. That's one thing. The second thing is that we mostly focus on the second order scaffolding, which means that we try uh, to help the students become self-regulators to actually use that also again in the future when the support is no uh, longer needed. So we don't help the students right at the moment. So that's one task that we have, but also we support the students to become self-regulators so that they can apply this 
techniques that they learn without the presence of the support in the future for dealing with new uh, situations. So these are the two good points that I wanted to also share with you in this uh, project. I think that's uh, very relevant. You know, it's interesting. It, it almost shifts the paradigm from, you know, you go to school, you have the oversight from a teacher, and then as soon as you graduate, you're on your own to really starting to bring some of that independent and self-regulated learning to the student while they're in school in that, you know, regulated environment where you can take on the self-learning, but also have some support. Uh, and then it's not as much of a harsh transition once you enter, you know, your, your career or, or post-education life. And, and on the flip side, it also removes teachers from that equation and allows, you know, a better uh, equation of student to teacher uh, resources with, uh, you know, not sacrificing any of the results and, and feedback that students are getting. So uh, I think this is, this is huge. And uh, I'm very excited to see all of the applications that not only AR and VR have, but, um, you know, that technology has on, on all these higher order skills and, and, uh, and education. So very excited to be following some of your projects. Sure. So uh, as we start to, to wrap up here, uh, I'd like to ask, you know, uh, do you have any advice for teachers, for professors, or for even school administrators who are looking to bring technology into their classroom, uh, into their university, or into their school district? And how might they do so in a thoughtful way that, uh, not only you know has the best results on paper, but has the best results uh, in actuality. Uh, yes, sure. Uh, so in order to uh, actually answer this question, to give some advice, we have to first uh, discover what are the challenges that the teachers and students are dealing with with the use of technology. So once we have explored those challenges, then we could also give advice. And if you don't mind, I would like to start with the challenges first. Fantastic. So where do you see the biggest challenges in implementing technology into the classroom uh, in an impactful and scalable way? Uh, uh, so there are a couple of challenges, at least based on my own observations of uh, research and practice. So the first thing is the lack of social aspects of learning. So believe or not, uh, we are dealing with this lack of social interaction in the face-to-face -face situation when we compare that. Uh, that's uh, why we first need to work on these challenges. So that's the number one challenge uh, that uh, there has been some solutions, for example, with the use of these uh, cameras, with the use of these uh, symbols, etc. We are dealing with those challenges currently. But the biggest challenge, uh, from my opinion, is the teacher's lack of pedagogical skills to incorporate technology. So it's not only technology. We should actually uh, get rid of this mind that the technology matters itself. Technology matters, of course, but more important than the technology is the pedagogical skills that the teachers have. For example, how can we use technology in the best possible way? So the, when you introduce a new technology, you need to also have the right pedagogy for it. You need to have the right teaching method for it. You cannot just introduce technology and uh, ignore the pedagogical aspect of it, ignore the content aspect of it. So that's one thing that we should uh, actually deal with. And then the diversity of technology, this is another challenge. So the, every day there is a new tool. So what tool do I use as a teacher? What tool makes the best learning uh, outcomes for students? We know that the technology is booming. There are tremendous number of learning management systems, tremendous number of tools, online uh, applications, etc. So this is something that we should uh, actually also think about. And uh, over the last couple of years, especially after uh, this COVID-19, I've seen that the technology is trying to pull the education with itself, but it should be the other way around, actually. It's education who decides what technology works best. So therefore, the, again, the focus should be on the content, on the pedagogy, on the education, and then we decide in order to have the best learning outcomes, what technology, what tool 
could be used, not the other way around, uh, let alone the teachers and the students' digital literacy. Nowadays, we don't have that much problem with the students because they are from this new generation and they are much better than us in terms of the, the use of technology and application. But still, we have some old uh, kind of generation of teachers that, uh, you know, they are not as uh, up to date as uh, us who are the young kind of teachers. So this is a kind of uh, challenge that we still uh, need to follow. And of course, uh, uh, if you ask me, I would like to also give some suggestions on how to uh, deal with these challenges. Yeah, absolutely. So part of the challenge is not only the rate at which the technology is, is increasing, but it's the rate at which teachers are willing to implement technology into the classroom and also their ability to do so in a thoughtful way. Uh, I think that's really interesting that you know, you've seen, especially in COVID, the capabilities driving what we're doing in the classroom instead of the needs of the classroom driving the capabilities that we're developing uh, in a technological sense. Uh, really interesting, uh, you know, I, I'm always challenges, but of course it's always the people challenges that, that throw the hiccup into the equation, uh, never usually the technology. Uh, so yeah, I, I think that does bring us to, uh, you know, our, our final question here. And that is for any of the, the teachers, professors, school administrators, uh, you know, listening, what advice would you have for them if they look to continue or start to implement technology into their classroom, into their university, or into their school district? How can they do so in a way uh, that makes the best results for their students? So my advice is that uh, first we need to be up to date. So there, uh, there are uh, technologies that are coming every day, tools, online platforms, online applications, and that requires a lifelong learning. So it's not like in the past that we had the same lesson plan uh, with the same technology we uh, went to the classroom. Nowadays, I'm teaching a course, for example, uh, in three different periods in one uh, academic year. And every period that I teach this, I use a new technology uh, because the technology is booming, the technology is growing, and we should also uh, actually go with the same speed in order to actually up-to-date ourselves and to catch up with the advancement of the technology. There is no escape anymore. So that's uh, number one advice for teachers that they should get themselves up-to-date about this technology. So the second thing is that the technology should not be used for fun, but for education. So maybe some students like the technology because it pro provides a lot of fun and entertaining, uh, entertaining aspects for their education. But if it doesn't have educational value, what is the use of this? Why should we use that? So the technology should be used uh, to make the education a little bit more fun. That's, uh, of course, uh, important, but also to uh, bring learning outcomes to help the students acquire their learning goals in the classroom. So that is uh, uh, something that we need to uh, actually care for when we design and when we use these kind of technologies in our education. So we should not go too fast with the technology whenever a teacher introduces a technology in the classroom, you should give a space to students to explore that technology, to make some mistakes, to make some fault uh, kind of movements with that technology. And you need to give some sort of demonstration. You need to actually let them explore this technology so that they can use it in the best uh, possible way. So basically prepare students with the new technologies and tools. Uh, the most important thing that I would like to mention is to make alignment between the use of technology, pedagogy, and content. So this alignment is crucial if you want to actually uh, benefit from the technology. If you use a technology which is not uh, uh, delivering the content that you want, so that is not the right technology. 
So if you use a technology without the proper uh, method, without the proper teaching method, again, that is not the right technology that you should use. So again, it is very important to make this alignment. And finally, I think we are in the transformation phase from kind of face-to-face -face, uh, setting classrooms to a kind of blended hybrid or uh, let's say online uh, kind of settings. So we are in this transformation phase and we should always remember that the technology and the online learning is not a replacement of the face-to-face -face situation. It's a kind of uh, additional added value that could bring to these face-to-face situations. And uh, I'm emphasizing on that because in the face-to-face -face situation, there are emotions involved, passion. There are all kinds of this affection that are part of learning, that are part of the student's uh, uh, the psychological mind so that we should actually take care of them and we should always uh, make sure that this affection, these emotions are also being handled nicely in the classrooms. Fantastic. So stay up to date and make sure the, the technology is there for education as well as for fun, but firstly for education and is, uh, you know, finally to remain, keep that personal touch in the classroom, that technology uh, is an addition and, and not a replacement. I think that sums it up fantastic. I wish uh, you know some of my teachers in the past had been a, a little more sportive with technology. I think you know it doesn't always have to necessarily be the one technology that will revolutionize the classroom, but I, I think a little bit of that exploration, uh, if only you know, makes the classroom a little bit more fun. Also, you know, leads to students being comfortable with exploring new technologies, seeing new interfaces, and just inputting and receiving information from new platforms and. And that's really the world we live in today, right? It's uh, an overwhelming amount of new technologies, new softwares, and getting comfortable there in a, in a quick way and, and kind of, you know, not letting it be a distraction from the true process of the learning uh, and, and the conversation and the discourse. So I think it, it mirrors real life uh, and, and education is, you know, always trying to catch up with real life. So that's really the best we can do is uh, you know, continue to, to adapt and prepare students for the real world in the best that we can. So, Omid, thank you for all of your time. Uh, your perspectives have been fantastic. I know all our viewers will really appreciate uh, your, your words of wisdom today. So thank you again. My pleasure. Great to be with you, Ted. Fantastic. Talk yeah. soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.